you've always had this like, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like let's 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 try things a little bit differently, I feel like. Yeah. And it's for good reasons, right? And like our field's getting used to like, oh, we can rethink the way that we do stuff. It's so, part of me feels so validated and part of me is like, hey, what's up with this? Because a lot of the things that people are getting excited about now, I've been doing for a long time. Right and I say. caught like a little bit of shade for, for you it, did, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, you know, well, is Ashley still doing ABA? Is this really the science? And, and I get it and I appreciate all those gentle or not so gentle criticisms because it, it makes me think critically. Um, but if I can describe what I'm doing and be conceptually systematic about it, I'm good to go. That's behavior analysis. Yes. That's it. Yeah. So just because we're applying the science in its most natural form and we're having a great time, it doesn't mean that I'm any less of a clinician or the service that we're provided is not aligned with the seven dimension yeah. so I, I'm pumped but I'm also like all right you yeah, know yeah 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 yep. yeah um can we pull apart some of those things like what can you tell me like what you were doing a little bit differently and like will you continue to do differently yeah so yeah. I'm in my 20th year now this year working in the fields of applied behavior analysis special education um, and I started in really structured restricted placements. Um, where I am in New Jersey a lot of self-contained classrooms one-to-one -one supports in there um, and I started to really think about how I learned best. So I'm an adult with ADHD who was an undiagnosed with child with a child with ADHD, and I learned best from the teachers I had really positive relationships with. And when I was able to be an active participant and an engaged learner, and I wasn't seeing any of that carryover, and it just kept eating away at me. Like we can do better. Something has to change. So I shifted to a completely uh, a group model. Um, so play-based social learning. And in a single activity, I can embed every single one of that learner's goals. And not just that learner, but the 12 other kids in that group are all benefiting. Um, and that's something that I really hadn't seen done. Um, people talk a lot about NET. I think there's value in that. It's still very structured. So if a child's playing with a truck, you have Oh, that's a blue truck. Good, do this, copy me. It's still very adult-led, that balance piece, or you want that more child-directed um, interaction. So that's really what I'm doing now. Cool, can you describe that model a little bit? Like, so you got groups? Like yeah, so family. we're group only. Um, tough to get going because you have to form best fit groups. So in our first couple years, we were putting kids together that maybe I wouldn't put together now. Um, but everybody in the group is within two to three years of each other. Each group has a completely different structure and routine because it's created to align with the specific needs of the learners. So our level A, our level B, or our level C learners. And then we conceptualize social behaviors. So there's 15 different domains or what we call global focus areas. Each group has specific areas they're focusing on, typically three or four because those are the most meaningful, relevant areas for that individual learner. So you won't see things like week one sportsmanship, week six, how to be a friend. If it's early social responding behaviors, that joint attention, social referencing, or adaptability and flexibility, that's what they work on in group every week until they don't need to work on that anymore. But within the context of ongoing play-based activities because they're kids, yeah, yeah, right? They're kids, so yeah. play with them and then sneak stuff in. Yeah. What is play-based? Like how, how do you wrap your, how do you conceptualize that? Where did you start as a Yeah, analyst? I would say probably first making the distinction between using toys to teach something and calling it play. So like you're doing a task, you're doing a work task, but you just happen to have a truck yeah. or, a, or a character. Or, so what I'm looking at is that distinction then um, between that and pure play. So something that's like child selected or you're following that learner motivation to make the decision about what you're incorporating or what you're using. Try and use materials that they're gonna come in contact with in other um, natural settings. You're programming for generalization from there um, as well. But a lot of engagement, reciprocity, positive affect, um, and again, just really emphasizing that following learner motivation. Very cool. What are some of the outcomes you're seeing or expecting? Like, what's happening it's, over the last? It, 
has completely blown my mind. You know, I thought, hey, we're gonna make some good gains here, but when I have parents dropping their kids off and saying like, the bus driver is commenting on how much more like socially aware the kid is, or we have kids moving from self-contained classrooms to far less restrictive classrooms in a matter of being with us for, you know, 12 weeks. Yeah, nice. Because we're hitting skills that n no one else is really focusing on. Like those early social responding behaviors, yeah. it's not let's tact yeah. 50 animals and color yeah. in the, you know? Yeah. I think there's value to a lot of those skills, but those are higher level skills. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you're not building that strong foundation. Um, so that feedback from just people in the child's, I, I'm calling everybody a kid, we serve yeah. through young adults, yeah, yeah. but just, you know, feedback from other people in that in that child's world. Um, it's just been awesome. What are you consuming research-wise? I read a lot outside the field of applied behavior analysis. Um, I think OTs have a lot of awesome things that they're putting out, SLP, so I really try to have this multidisciplinary yeah. network going. I'd really love to see a better understanding of just child development and what is developmentally appropriate when we're looking at play skills or um, looking at social behaviors. Because sometimes we're trying to hit things way up here. Like cooperative play, for example, yeah. Deve develops like a, typically around you know three and a half, four years old. So when you're playing with an 18 month old or a teen who's developmentally, you know, um, delayed by quite a bit, we have to make sure that we're meeting them where they are and that our expectations are appropriate to set them up for success. So definitely more understanding of child um, development and having our field really prioritize that when we're choosing targets. Moving to a group model from one-to-one -one is very, very different. I was especially concerned about how many goals we could target, how are you collecting data, and I learned to not let that kind of stuff get in the way. Focus on those genuine interactions first. And if you're hitting like those behavioral cusps or those those um, pivotal behaviors, you don't have to take data on, you know, 20 things. You're going to teach this and get this, this, and this for free. Yeah. yeah. So kind of, it's really a mindset shift. We talk about, you know, we're talking about that all the time to get out of our own way clinically. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think it's something that I would want people to know. Like, you can do this, yeah. but you're going to be your biggest barrier. How do you, how do people go about that? Is there like resources you can lean on or like any stories that you had yourself that were really useful? For the mindset shift? Yeah, I yeah. think just, a lot, I'm a lot on social media yeah. a lot and I kind of keep a pulse on, you know, who's kind of putting out what or who tr who's trying new things and connect with them and build relationships with them and um, support each other. If they go to something or they read some article, send it over to you. And just that collaboration and professional development. Very cool, cool. Any other buckets of things that you wanted to hit on? Maybe just how we're defining social skills or conceptualizing social skills. Okay, a tell lot, me more about that. Yeah, so a lot of times I'll hear, oh, I have a, a client or a learner, but they're not ready for a social skills group. So I think that's important in, in defining, operationally defining, right, what we should be so good at, what we're talking about when we talk about social skills. So your earliest learners, your level um, one VB map kids can absolutely benefit from developing social behaviors, but it looks different in your playing of peekaboo or your joint activity routines, sensory social routines. So really understanding what we're talking about um, when we say we're running a social skills program where we are or are not targeting social skills. If you're working with humans, you should be targeting social skills and, and whether you know it or not or call it that or not. I look at the, the group, designing a good group model, having the ability to actually get in a way back to the roots of uh, there's a lot of need out there. We need to find ways, not like a way to do things, but we need to find many ways and we gotta solve that scale problem. So are you able to like... It's like an insurance thing too, <laughs> yeah. right? So having okay. group codes for insurance, so I don't work with insurance companies, that, yeah. that's the consistent barrier. So when I'm supporting other agencies or organizations in putting groups together, that's one of the first questions is, will we be able to um, bill for this? What do those codes look like? Do we have to have all our kids with one-to-ones in, in the group? Um, so those are certainly some challenges I think need to be worked out on that end are those um, codes logistically. Are not there right now? Yeah. Yeah. They're either not, not there or what is there isn't sustainable. So what work needs to be done, I guess, for the field to kind of like pull this together? 
wish someone would advocate for that and, and, and change all, it's not gonna be me in that, yeah, in that insurance yeah. world. Um, but I think just on the ground level, like those of us who are just showing up and doing that direct service uh, every day is really thinking about um, what we're focusing on, the type of skills that we're prioritizing because the goal is to be effective learners and learn from the natural environment. So even if they're not in that group right now, consistently thinking about making sure that you're building the skills to, to get there and be successful there. I think just in, in summary, we talk a lot about making shifts happen, these great things that are happening in one-to-one -one settings. We can apply that in a group and support our learners and being HRE in a group setting and it can look natural, it can be fun, and we're still absolutely sticking with science and we're clinically strong when we do it. That's fantastic. So where do people learn more about how to make that happen? Well, you can always come to me. <laughs> so we're Mission Cognition. We're everywhere. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, our site, uh, TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do, yeah, I do a lot of professional coaching and consultation cool. um, now, one-to-one -one mentorship stuff for smaller companies or, or large scale. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I've made tons of mistakes, so I'll support <laughs> you know others in not making yeah. those. Yeah. Um, but there's just amazing benefits, so I hope people take me up on that. Ashley Rose, I'm a behavior analyst specializing in the development of play and social behaviors.